Hallelujah. You have won the victory. Death could not hold him down. He is the risen king. We give him honor. We give him thanks. We give him praise. For yet another day, we want to thank you and welcome you to the Utah New Testament Church of God this evening. I want to apologize for the challenge that we all have been experiencing. But to God be the glory, we are seeking to overcome technical difficulties and uh, every way and forth. We praise God in spite of. Welcome to those who are joining us on our Facebook page, YouTube channel. We give God thanks for you. Again, we appreciate you. Welcome, my brothers and sisters of the Yorta New Testament Church of God. Before we get into the meat of the matter, let me just take this time to say thanks to God and also to update those who join us that coming up on this Friday, August 27, at 7 p.m., we will be having our rally. Uh, a sanctuary to construct. We are presently doing some construction. We have started the ball rolling. It requires a lot of resources. We believe God for an incredible move and just a, a faith move. We are trusting God to respond in the midst of this time in a favorable way. And so I want to invite you to join us with other churches as we have our rally and I ask you to come and contribute as the Lord leads bring a free will offering and come with a praise hallelujah bring a free will offering and come with a praise and let us have a wonderful time as we have our virtual rally we are not able to have rally in sanctuary due to the new uh, protocols and the new wave happening in Jamaica right now. But nevertheless, you can join us on YouTube and Facebook at Uaton NTCOG at 7 p.m. on Friday evening, that is this Friday, August 27, when we'll be having rally. May the Lord bless you as you rally with us. Remember now, share the information with someone and invite them to come and bring a love offering. Bring a free will offering. Bring an offering of help. God bless you. Our scripture this evening, as we look at our theme, you ran well, who hindered you? Last week, we went to a place a certain portion of this presentation <clears throat> and this week you want to follow through and we want to look at Galatians 5 7 to 15 Paul speaking to the church he says you did run well who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. This persecution cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. He says in verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. That means you, you, you will not shift your mind of Christ. But he that trouble you, or he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he will he, he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross cease. I would that, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. 
For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 15 says, but if you and I, if we bite and devour one another, take heed that he be not consumed one of another. Father, we thank you again for your words. We thank you for your revelation. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for those who have joined us and those who will share, oh God, and invite someone to, to take part of this meal you have provided. Bless your words unto our hearts and glorify your name. Let the words of our hearts and the meditation, let the words of our mouth, Father, and the meditations of our heart, heart be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus. Last week we looked at Uranwell. Paul speaking about is reminding the church of their starting out with God in faith. Here in the gospel. But starting well was not enough or good enough. He encouraged the church not only to start well, but to continue in the race. Then he raised up the question, who will hinder you from obeying the truth? He knew that false teachings came from persons who were seeking to hinder the growth and the abiding in Christ of the church. He knew that false persons who would want to seek to take the believers back on the bondage to keeping the law. And he saw it as persons seeking to hinder the church that stepped out in faith from going forward. Then he moved on and he says, a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. And he speaks to the corrupting influence of legalism and other doctrines like leaven that is placed in a little loaf that takes over the whole loaf. So he says a little leaven will take over the whole loaf. A little false teaching, a little bit of flesh trying to act like spirit, a little bit of emotion running wild will eventually take over if we don't hold to authentic truths and spirit-led worship. But Paul says he have confidence in the church. Wanting to leave the confrontation on a positive note, Paul expressed his confidence in the Galatian church, which was really confidence in the Lord who is able to keep them. So Paul was saying, look here, it doesn't matter who is trying to turn you over or overrun you. I am confident in the God who calls you to keep us in Christ. He was confident of the spirit that sealed us, would not leave us nor abandon us, but would abide with us forever. And then he made a request. He said uh, he wished that the person who was seeking to do this, those troublemakers, for them to bear their judgment. And so, my brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter who he or she is. Paul wanted 
that person or those persons to bear their judgment. Then he brought us into the teachings and circumcision. He says, if I still preach circumcision, Paul makes it clear that he no longer preached the necessity of circumcision because the church did not receive the spirit or salvation or liberty in Christ through circumcision, but rather through the hearing of faith, through hearing the gospel, the saving grace, the saving work of Christ, the church was set free. And he says, if he then continues to, to preach legalism, preach the doctrine of circumcision, then the offense of the cross or the offense of Christ will cease. You know, we, we, we wear Christ as a garment. As the scripture says, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, the fact that he is persecuted by the legalist is evident enough of this. Because Paul, preaching now, a man who used to persecute the church, is now preaching that the only way to make it in is through the work of Jesus Christ. Faith in the works that he did. So it says, if he preached circumcision, then the offense, and that is what many persons even today is seeking for us to do. We must, not, we must not preach on the cross. Don't preach on the blood. Don't preach on the Holy Spirit. Don't preach ah, on the authentic word of God. P Paul admonished Timothy that be careful because in the last days, persons will hire preachers who will tickle their fancy, who will preach things that they want to hear and not things that the word of God wants to raise up. Paul was saying to, uh, Paul said, said to Timothy, you will have in the last days persons who will not hold to standard. They will not preach standard. They will preach below the belt for the sake of monetary gain, for the sake of favoritism, for the sake of being accepted, for the sake of promotion, and to be in a certain club or clique. So Paul said, there will come that time. And in those settings, the offense of the cross ceased because when you preach Christ and him crucified to the Jews, <laughs> it's a stumbling block. To those who seek to find another way, it's a stumbling block. To those who feel they can get to God without Christ Jesus, without Calvary, it's a stumbling block. So Paul raised it up. He says, look here, legalism can't handle the offense of the cross. The whole point of Jesus dying on the cross was to say, you can't save yourself. I must die in your place. And then he moved on. And he said, I could wish that those who trouble you would even be cut off themselves. And this is where we're picking up back from last week. Because you see, we want to conclude this study this evening. So Paul says, finally, I wish, I would, in verse 12, I would they were even cut off which trouble you. Finally, Paul wished that those who demanded circumcision among the Gentiles would go all the way themselves and amputate altogether and not merely their foreskin. Because he was saying, if you're going to do, if you want to hold to legalism, then if you want to hold to the law, then just do the whole law the whole law. So legalism is no little thing. 
it takes away our liberty and puts us in bondage. It makes Jesus and his work of no profit to us. It puts us under obligation to the whole law. Now, if legalism does all it, it takes away our liberty and puts us in bondage. When I got saved, I found freedom. When I found Christ, I found liberty. When I found Jesus, I became free. Free at last. Free from the sin and the shame of my past. When the scripture says, whom the son set free is free indeed, I found freedom in Jesus Christ. And this is what the cross does. But legalism takes away the liberty that the spirit of God gives us through redemption, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it makes Jesus and his work of no profit, as, as, as Paul says, if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If you go back under the law or under legalism, then all the works of Jesus Christ will profit you nothing. It puts us under obligation to the whole law. A, a burden that the Jews couldn't bear, those who got the oracles of God couldn't carry it. Because no man can do God's will without his spirit. Without the grace that he gave to us, John 3, 16, for God's all of the world. No man. For to as many that has believed on him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. The sons of God are persons whom the Father can say, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hence, Without the Son of God giving us power or the rights to, through faith in him and his work, to become the sons of God, we are under obligation to do something that we are not able to do that is impossible. Keep the whole law. It violates the work of the Spirit of God. Because you're saying... Paul asked the question to the Galatian, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He says, if you receive it by hearing of faith, why are you seeking to go back under the law of bondage, under legalism? So what it does, it violates the works of the spirit because you, the, 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 the Christian or the professed Christian or the person who is tricked to go and seek to please God through legalism or the law, will not yield to the leading of the spirit. Remember now, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And the life that the spirit give is an abundant life in Christ. It's a leading, guiding, word-given life. A walking in the spirit. Thy word is a lamp to my feet, life that the spirit gives. So legalism violates the work of the spirit. And... It makes us focus on things that are irrelevant. Washing of hands, ceremonial laws, things that can't save you. Jesus accused the Pharisees and the leaders of washing the, 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 inside, the outside of the bowl, <laughs> but the inside is filthy. In other words, they look good outside, but inside. There's no cleansing. The blood. The law could not atone. There's no atonement in the law. There is no atonement in the law. Paul says the law revealed to me that I was a sinner. And that which I looked to give me life slew me. Is the law evil? No. It raised up the fact that we are dead. And in sin. Separated from God. That's the purpose of the law. Grace in Jesus Christ is what invites us into life in the spirit. So it makes us focus on things that are irrelevant. It keeps us from running the race Jesus set before us. Because Jesus has called us to some works that God has established for us 
to achieve. But when we approach the kingdom from a legalistic perspective or from a law point of view, then we, we, we end up not journeying well, not walking by faith. It isn't from Jesus. It, it is not from Jesus. All the above is not from Jesus. What Jesus offers us is grace and sonship to run the race set before us. And so, as we move on this evening, we want to look at how to live in the liberty of Jesus. 13 through 15. Paul is raising up, using liberty to love each other. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by another. Paul has made the point over and over again. The Christian life is a life of liberty. Jesus came to set captives free, not to keep them in bondage or put them in bondage all over again. It is worth asking if people see us as people of freedom and liberty. It, that's, that's a question to ask. When persons have encounter with us, what, how do they see us? Do they see us as persons who are free? Persons of liberty? Huh? That's the question. Christians are seen as people more bound up and hung up than anyone else sometimes. You wonder if, if, if all this grace that you, you speak of and if all this grace you, you, you are preached every Sunday... Sunday night, Wednesday, Tuesdays, whenever there's a prayer meeting, when you go to seminars and functions, if all the grace that we, we hear speaks of this amazing liberty, why are, why does it then seem that more persons seek to operate or operate as bound and free? The apostle is saying, that freedom is of the essence of being a Christian. It is the fundamental basis of all Christian living. Freedom. We must be free in our spirit. In a time when the world is going through a pandemic, the Christian must not be in bondage to fear. The Christian must not be in bondage to doubt and, and gossips and hearsay. The Christian must find his or her liberty in Christ, in the spirit, the Christian must not walk according to the course of the world or listen to the counsel of the ungodly. The Christian must know, thus said the Lord, the Lord's word is the Christian standard of living. It is where we find peace of mind and liberty in the spirit. So the apostle is saying, freedom is the essence of being a Christian. Because if you are set free from sin, which is the greatest yoke of bondage, then what other bondage do you see as a challenge to the God who set you free? When, when, when the spies went into Canaan, when they met Rahab, she said to them, the whole city is terrified of you. Why? We have heard what you have God have done to great Pharaoh. And to all those who stand against you and the cities at your disposal. You, you have to understand that, you know, when, when, when persons here, here are Christian, they are looking for a level of fundamental freedom. Liberty is the essence of being a Christian. But then Paul admonishes the church. He says, only do not use your liberty 
as an opportunity for the flesh. The great fear of the legalists is that liberty will be used on a, as an opportunity for the flesh. The idea is that people will just go on and sin as they please. Then say to a spineless God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. And they go on doing whatsoever they want again. Paul recognized the danger of this attitude. So he warned against it here. And we know there are persons today in our churches. Persons that the world have said, Pastor, that member goes to your church. Or man, that is that person is a Christian and they are involved in activities that the world is not involved in or they practice they are not having a struggle and they slip and say God I, I'm sorry and they come around no there are persons who take for granted the grace of God there are persons who just say I'm just gonna live up all I want to live God grace will cover me and so Yes, God's grace is amazing. But presumptuous sins will bar you from experiencing true liberty in Christ. One of the things I want to say, another way to miss this, is that God is not sitting with a big stick looking to knock us over our heads because we may fall or sin. And God is not seeking to say he doesn't want you if you fail. God is saying, look here, I am willing to give you all you need not to. And if you do, I am willing to make a way to pardon you. But, not be, but he's warning that if you do, don't practice. Don't let it become a habit. So John says, if anyone sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, he says, if you are willing to confess, he is faithful and just. To forgive and to cleanse from all sins, all unrighteousness. For all unrighteousness is sin. So Paul is admonishing the danger. He's saying to persons, recognize the danger of this, of this attitude. So first, Paul writes to brethren. These are those who are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3.22 these are those who were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. He's writing to those. These ones have been called to liberty. As Paul puts it earlier in the chapter, they have been made free by Jesus Christ. Now they are called to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ had made them free, Galatians 5.1. They have been set free. Now the question is, how will they use their freedom? We just came out of our celebration of emancipation and independence as, a, as Jamaicans. And I, I, you know, I remember saying, when I look at how we operate, how we behave, how, how are we using our liberty? To commit crime, to hate each other, to harm and hurt each other, to deceive each other, to be covetous of each other to the point of death. This is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, how will you use the freedom you find in Christ? To condemn others? You don't remember the days you used to struggle? Oh, I remember my days. Why then would I use my freedom to hung others or use my freedom to disregard the sacrifice of God through Jesus Christ for my soul. Paul is saying they have been set free. Now the question is how will they use this liberty? You and I who have been set free, how do we exercise our freedom in Christ? Do we use our freedom to, to Destroy others. Huh? Do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. Clearly, we can choose to use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. 
the, that option, that danger is open to us. We can take this glorious freedom Jesus has given us, spin it and use it as a way to please ourselves at the expense of others. Because the context focus on the way we treat one another. Paul has in mind using our freedom in a way that tramples on the toes of others. And so often, or every so often, you find that there is a type of classism that you will run into in certain settings where there are persons who feel that because they have been in Sunday school all their lives and you came out of prostitution or you came out of a gang or you came out of drugs or idolatry or adultery that there is they are at a different level <laughs> and that they are in, you know at a better place than you are but the last time I checked my Bible the Bible says the Bible says we are the body of Christ we are one body with many members so we must be careful how we use our freedom. We must not use our freedom to walk over others. But we must use our freedom to point other, others to freedom. We must use our freedom to raise up the liberator to show others that it is through the grace of God and the work of Jesus Christ and Calvary that we were set free. This term, opportunity, was applied in a military language to a base of operation and generally to any starting point of action or for action. We are tempted to use our liberty in Jesus as a base of opportunity for, self, <laughs> for selfish sins. You know, you know, there are persons who use the liberty in Jesus to do some things that you wonder if they think before they act. And to say some things you wonder if they think before they speak. Or if they weighed their actions against what God says and the thoughts of the Lord. God said to Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. Two different planet two different planet he says to Ezekiel stand on the wall be the watchman hear the word from my mouth and speak from me don't speak for me and so persons at times like to speak for God and and they will think for God. But that's, 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 that's not it. It is easy to think. Liberty is the right to sin. Or the privilege to do whatever evil our hearts want to do. Instead, this liberty in the spirit is a spirit-given desire and ability to do what we should do in honoring God. The liberty we have is a free. Remember, when we were in sin, can, can we just go back for a minute and try and remember the days when we were in sin and we, we felt embarrassed and ashamed about our actions and we really wanted to do right, but we, we did wrong and we felt so ashamed. And we, 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 we would say, if only I could serve God, if only I could stop committing adultery, if only I could stop fornicating, if only I could stop stealing and telling lies or, 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 or killing people or whatever it was that the Lord draw us out of. Paul is saying when you were in bondage you couldn't have this liberty to raise your hands and say hallelujah. You, you, when, you, when you were in bondage we couldn't sing my hallelujah belongs to you. We couldn't do that. When we were in bondage, we could not love our enemies and do good to those who hate us. When we were in bondage, the course of the world 
was our was the path we were on. But when we got the liberty, we realized that we can now please God in thinking. We can please God in our choices. We can please God. We have been empowered through this liberty to live a holy life. That's the kind of liberty that Paul is speaking to. A liberty that is spirit-giving. Our spirit-given. A, a, a liberty that is directed by the spirit. It is a spiritual desire to please God. That's the kind of liberty we talked about. So he says, through love serve this liberty is it it, it it works through love we are liberated to to serve each other through love this is the antidote for using liberty as an occasion to the flesh if we if we allow liberty to be controlled or, or our christian liberty to be controlled by our carnal desires and the fleshly attitude that's like having the venom of a serpent in your vein. So if you want to get the antidote so that the flesh does not manage how you live at this liberty, it is through loving service to each other. It is how we show love to each other. Jesus told his disciples, when men see how you love each other, then they'll know you are my disciples. Love is the hallmark of disciple of, of, of Love is the hallmark of Christianity. It is the hallmark of one who professed to know Jesus as Lord. Love is the hallmark. So Paul says, this is the antidote. Through love, serve one another. The antidote for the occasion to the flesh. The flesh expects others to conform to us and doesn't care much about others. But when we through love serve one another we conquer the flesh it isn't through an obsessive contemplative attitude that we overcome the flesh but by getting out and serving others this is exactly the pattern set by jesus he had more liberty than anyone Whoever walked this earth, he had more liberty. Jesus had more liberty than anyone who walked the earth. So he says, this is how we exemplify love. Jesus, 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 who had more liberty than anyone else who walked this earth. Yet he used his liberty through love to serve and to save us. Then Paul, in seeking to bring this to and then says, For all the law is fulfilled in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. This attitude of service towards one another fulfills the great commission or the great commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it keeps us from destroying ourselves through strife. Beware lest you become consumed by one another. It is as if Paul addressed the legalist again and said, you want to keep the law? Here you have, here you have it. Love your neighbor as yourself and you would have fulfilled the law in one word. So, if, for, for, so Paul is saying, you see the person who wants to take us back in bondage into the legalistic thing, Paul says, hey, the law is fulfilled in one word. Don't seek to serve yourself. Seek to serve others. Hmm? He says, Beware, lest you be consumed by one another. It is as if Paul, I want to say it again, addressed the legalist again and said, You want to keep the law? Here you have it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you 
would have fulfilled the law in one word. If you want to know how you ought to love your neighbor, ask yourself how you want to be loved. I think that's food for thought. When we say we want to love our neighbors, you must not think of how to love your neighbor. You, know? you must think of how you love you and how you want to be loved and take that and you apply it to your neighbor from that perspective. So Paul says, if you want to know how you ought to love your neighbor, ask yourself how much you love yourself. If you, if you were to get into trouble or danger, you would be glad to have the love and the help of all men. So you do not need any book of instruction to teach you how to love your neighbor. All you have to do is take a look in your own heart. We just need to look in our own hearts. And it will tell you how you ought to love, how we ought to love our neighbors. So then he moves on as he gets down to the final verse. He says, but if, let me, let me just find that and, and, and read it. He says, but if, in verse 15, you bite and devour one another, take heed that ye he be not consumed one by another. And in speaking to biting and, devour, and devouring one another, this reminds us of a pack of wild animals. That's how the church can act when it is using, when it, when it loses it's liberty in Christ. When liberty is used as an occasion, this is how we can act. As a platform to promote selfishness. If you want to see some actions, put two selfish persons together. Selfish people will eventually be consumed by one another. Because if I'm selfish, I don't want you to have your way. I don't want your idea to be the idea that is bought. If I'm selfish, then the company must run the way I see. If I'm selfish, then it is my idea and my plans that must first be recognized and be seen as the plan. And so, <laughs> eventually, what that causes is a lot of strife and contention. The loveless life is a life lived on the level of animals. The loveless life is a life lived on the level of animals with a concern only for oneself. No matter what the cost to others may be. The loveless life is a life lived on the level of animals while are with a concern only for oneself, no matter what the cost to others may be. Let us, my brothers and sisters and friends, take God's word seriously. The word of God is the Christian standard. It's a Christian road map. It is, it is where the Christian live. The Bible says that we walk by faith, not by sight. That the just shall live by faith. David made it clear in Psalm 119, Thy word is my guide. It's the lamp to my feet and the light to my path. He says not only is it that for the Christian, the word must be treasured in the vault of our hearts so we don't sin ourselves into bankruptcy. We must have God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against thee. In other words, I will not sin until I'm bankrupt. There's no way back to grace. That's what the word does. Order my steps in your words, dear Lord. Order my thoughts in your words. Guide my feet. Guide my hands. Guide everything about me. The word. Jesus says, if you abide in me, what, what the liberty of the spirit does, 
what the freedom through Calvary does is cause us through the word to become abiding citizens. Abiding. We become abiding people of faith. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you have the liberty to ask what you will and it shall be done. But if you're not abiding, then we can't use the liberty in the right way because it is through abiding that we are guided by the Spirit as to how the liberty works. I want to say to us this evening as we close, may we not look at this letter to the Galatians as simple. May we not feel that we have the right because we have liberty to just walk on people or disregard the grace of God. May we remember that judgment first begin at the house of God and that there's no deed we have done that will not be brought into judgment. But here's the beauty. When we put our case before the Lord, we have a mediator who sits on our behalf, a defender, one who is willing to say, let him father, I'm going to clean up around him and fertilize him and let him grow and bear fruit. And that is the beauty of having Jesus Christ as our Savior. May God bless us. May he keep us. May he cause his face to shine upon us. May God teach us as we submit to learning how to walk and how to bring him honor and glory. My brothers and sisters, friends, I say to us, walk in the spirit. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free. Be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. Father, we commit ourselves in your hands. We commit those who will hear and watch and share this in your care. Lord, will you touch a heart and change a mind and give light to a life in the name of Jesus Christ as we honor you. May your words, Lord, bless 